All right, uh, let's get the show on the road. Hello, everyone. Hope you're well. Welcome to another class. Still have some people trickling in here, um, but uh, let's get into it. Hopefully, you guys had a good weekend, and hopefully, the quiz was okay. So, we had our first quiz on Friday. Let me. Someone else coming in here. A couple other people. Share the screen. Um, yeah, so we had our first quiz on Friday, and hopefully that was okay. And it is my understanding that you guys went over the quiz afterwards. Is that correct? Yes. We briefly did, yes. Okay. Um, and hopefully that... Oh, I did something here. Okay, so hopefully that was helpful. Um, to you guys. But of course, if anything was not helpful, you can always reach out to me or even your recitation instructor uh, during office hours. For now, we're going to uh, jump in, just jump straight in. Uh, we have a lot to cover this semester, so we're going to get started. Something that's kind of going to be an odd uh, thing out is actually hyperbolic functions. So this is in our syllabus, and it is something that I want to cover, of course. Um, but in some sense, it's going to be something that you can survive without. Um, so I'm pretty much going to cover the background that you need here very quickly, because ultimately we're not, we're not going to need these guys to understand any of the methods or strategies or techniques that we're going to do. It's just one, hyperbolic functions is a class of functions that you should just know about, just as a general thing. If you tell everyone that, oh, I did calculus in college, I went through the calculus sequence, hyperbolic functions is going to be one of those things that everyone would expect you to know about. Um, uh, really, the screen is uh, blurry to you guys? Yeah, and there's like a yeah. lot of weird boxes kind of covering the page. Uh-huh. Hmm, that is... Uh, Quite strange. I made my screen like I exited and made it smaller and it's a little bit clearer, but I still definitely can't read a lot of it. Hmm. I don't know what could be causing that. Um, maybe I will exit. And come back. That's, That's a lot better. Oh, now, now you guys can see it? Yeah. Okay, all right. Okay, cool. So I think I just accidentally pressed the button that I shouldn't have pressed. Okay, and I unchecked it. All right, so, um, all right, yeah, okay, cool. All right, so, yeah, where, what was I saying? So if you tell anyone you did uh, the calculus sequence in college, people are going to expect hyperbolic functions to be something that you should know about. And they are very convenient in a lot of scenarios. That being said, you can actually go through the calculus sequence and your entire mathematical life and never have to actually use them. And so in that regard, they are kind of a lower priority. And so we're really gonna just rush through these, uh, just kind of tell you what you need to know. But pretty much what you need to get from this section is the formulas that are going to arise because of these functions and situations in which you're going to use them. We are going to go through some examples, and I am going to test you on them specifically in the next quiz. However, after that, I'm not going to directly test you on them ever again. Um, and you can survive without knowing them. But like I said, they are convenient. There are things you should know about. And so um, we're going to go through them. So we're going to talk about things called hyperbolic trig functions. And you're going to see why they're called tr trig functions uh, in a bit. You'll also know why they're called hyperbolic. So remember what happened with uh, regular trig functions. Okay, so remember where the original trig functions came from. Basically, they came from us examining the unit circle, right? So we had the unit circle and we wanted to find a way. Is there a way for us to, um, let me draw here. if I pick a random coordinate on the unit circle, like this coordinate right here, uh, right? And it's x comma y. And so what we want to do is uh, use functions 
to track the x, y coordinates on the unit circle. These were, uh, well, remember, x could be tracked by a function that we call the cosine of an angle theta. y was tracked by the function that we call the sine of the angle theta. So if you had a line uh, connecting the origin to this coordinate that's on the unit circle, um, and theta was the angle um, that off that line made with the positive x-axis, then we could use a function to track the x and y coordinates, right? So that gave us sine and cosine. We invented all the other trig ratios. Okay, so the tangent was the sine divided by the cosine. The cotangent is the cosine divided by the sine. Uh, the secant is one over cosine. The cosecant is one over sine, et cetera. We developed all of that and boom, trigonometry was formed, right? So you should have seen this developed in pre-calc. I did it with uh, my pre-calc class. I believe I linked you guys to that video playlist. Um, so you don't really need to remember all of that at this point. Uh, we are going to see another nice use, and we're going to realize that uh, the development of trigonometry is actually a very specific case of something that we're going to study more generally in, say, phase three of this class, where we're talking about parametric equations. But that was trig function. This is where they came from, right? Find functions that track the x and y coordinates along the unit circle. We call these the trigonometric functions and we can develop six trigonometric ratios from these guys. Similarly, what we want to do is, let's do this with the unit hyperbola. So by setting up functions to track uh, coordinates on the unit circle, x squared plus y squared equals one, we get the trig functions. However, if you want to track things around the unit hyperbola, x squared minus y squared equals one, and that is the graph that looks like uh, pretty much this guy here. That's this part of the graph here. This is y equals x squared minus y squared. Uh, or, no. It's not a function. You can't write it like that. So let's go back. So this is the graph of uh, x squared minus y squared equals one. You get this kind of function. It's called a hyperbola. We're actually gonna talk about hyperbolas again later on, but just to remind you, this is probably something that I expect you guys to have seen before. It's called a hyperbola. So now we want to track coordinates on this hyperbola. So if I were to pick, uh, say, an x comma y coordinate on the hyperbola, can I track the x and the y with functions? And it turns out that you can. It turns out that you can track the x with a function that we call the hyperbolic cosine, right? So this is, it's called hyperbolic because we're tracking on the hyperbola instead of the circle. And because it tracks, it's kind of the equivalent of the cosine on the unit circle. We call it the hyperbolic cosine. It's called cosh is how it's pronounced. And this is the notation for it. Y is called the cinch function. Um, and x here is actually going to be double the area of the shaded region that you see in this diagram. And, and that's basically what these functions are, cosh and cinch. So you, you can think of them as being developed very similarly to trig functions, which is why they're called trig functions. And they're called hyperbolic trig functions because we develop them from the hyperbola and not from the unit circle. Okay? So we immediately get an identity right away cosh squared minus sin squared equals one. It's the same reason why you know that cosine squared plus sine squared equals one, because the x and y represent sine and cosine. And because the equation of this unit circle is x squared plus y squared equals one, you get cosine squared plus sine squared equals one. Similarly, you automatically have an identity. Cosh squared minus sin squared is equal to one. And this is starting to, hopefully, uh, you can start to appreciate that this is where you're going to see where a hyperbolic trig function might be convenient, where a trig function itself is not. So sometimes we're going to have the sum of squares and we want to set that equal to one and trig functions are very useful for scenarios like that. However, what if there's a minus sign? What if there's a difference of squares equal to one? How would we model that with functions? Turns out you'd use a hyperbolic trig function instead. Okay, so we have this identity right away. And again, we can define some uh, hyperbolic trig ratios. So we can get something that we call the tanch. And that is the wrong way around. Which is the cinch over the cosh. 
right? So just like you take sine x divided by cosine x, you get the tangent of x. We have something called the tanch. That's how it's pronounced. This is the hyperbolic tangent. It's just sinh divided by cosh. Um, we have the hyperbolic secant. It's one over the hyperbolic cosine, one over cosh x. And we have the hyperbolic cosecant, which is one over uh, sinh x. And of course, you have the hyperbolic cotangent, which is cosh over sinh, et cetera. So you, the, they are named very similarly to trig functions because it turns out, especially in formulas, they behave a lot like trig functions. You can also get these identities here. And this comes from, well, if we have, let's use a different color than red. Uh, we know that cosh squared minus sinh squared equals one. What we can do is if I divide both sides by cosh squared, well, cosh squared over cosh squared is one, sin squared over cosh squared is tanj squared, and then this guy here is just your hyperbolic secant squared. And so that will lead to this identity right here. And of course, you'll probably realize that it is very similar to one plus tangent squared equals secant squared, what you would learn from trigonometry. Um, the difference is, of course, here, it's a minus instead of a plus. And similarly to that, if I divided both sides by sinh squared, Then this part here is actually your cotangent squared. This, of course, is just one. And this would be your hyperbolic cosecant squared. So you can figure out these identities, same way you figure them out from trick functions. The difference is you'll notice that they have a way of being convenient in the sense that where there are pluses in our trig function formulas, there are going to be minuses in these formulas. And the difference in that sign might be very convenient. And that's kind of what I spoke about the blurb here. So there are going to be times, and we'll see this later on when we do things like trig substitution, where I'll see an expression like one plus x squared. And I'll think to myself, oh, that reminds me of one plus tangent squared, right? And because I can replace one plus tangent squared with secant squared, I'm going to be able to replace one plus x squared with something involving a secant. However, what if you had one minus x squared, right? Not the one plus. What can you use now? Well, instead of using the tangent identity, we can now use the tanch identity, right? So the hyperbolic trig functions are convenient because there are cases where it would be nice to use a trig function, but the signs just don't work out. And you're going to often see that the signs would work out if we use the hyperbolic trig function instead. So this is why they're convenient. Like I said, not absolutely necessary, but they will be very convenient. And I'll, I'll mention when these uh, parts show up. Now it turns out that why you can survive without knowing these guys is because really the hyperbolic trig functions, they are not a whole new class of functions. So in pre-calculus and calculus one, you learned about what were called the elementary continuous functions. There were six different functions that we know about and that we use in mathematics all the time that we consider elementary. These were like the six infinity stones that make up the mathematical universe, at least the elementary mathematical universe, right? These were polynomials, uh, trig functions, exponentials, uh, logarithms, logarithm functions, rat rational functions, and radical functions. So there were six types of functions. It turns out that the hyperbolic functions are not an entire new class. They're actually a combination of things. Uh, you can actually write down the uh, hyperbolic trig functions in terms of exponentials. So they're not really a whole new thing. You can actually express them as a combination of familiar things. So yes, in and of themselves, we can define them in terms of coordinates along the hyperbola. However, we can actually redefine them in terms of exponential functions. And so they're really just a sum of exponential functions, how you can think of them. Uh, and so you can actually prove it's actually annoying computation. It's not hard, but it's kind of annoying to get to this point. You can actually prove that the cosh function is actually e to the x plus e to the minus x all over two, while the sinh function is e to the x minus e to the minus x all over two, right? 
And this allows us to derive a lot of other nice rules. So for example, we can now start talking about derivatives and integrals of these functions, right? So let's say I wanted to find the derivative of cosh, right? I can figure that out uh, by just replacing it with the exponential equivalent. So let's say I wanted to find what is the derivative of the cosh function, this new function that we just figured out. Well, by replacing the cosh with its exponential equivalent, I'll be able to actually figure out its derivative. So, uh, and here's where you guys can chime in. If I were to differentiate this guy, e to the x plus e to the minus x all over two, how would I differentiate that? What would the derivative of that thing look like? Well, you can take out the half and then take the mm -hmm. derivative of e to the x and e to the negative x multiplying right. by that half. What's the half? derivative of e to the x? e to the x again. E right? The, and what's the derivative of e to the minus x? Minus e to the minus x. Right. And the over 2, you can just leave it, right? So this is something you would have seen in calculus 1. If you're differentiating a fraction where the denominator is a constant, you essentially just leave the denominator alone and differentiate the numerator. If you're differentiating a fraction where the numerator is a constant, uh, what you would do is you'd move up the denominator, write it to the power of minus 1, and use a power rule or the chain rule, right? So to differentiate this, I just differentiate the numerator, leave the denominator. Now, what is this here? That's cinch. cinch X. X. That's cinch, right. That's actually the definition of cinch. And so what you find here is that the derivative of cosh is cinch. Similarly, you can show that the derivative of cinch is cosh. And in fact, you can eventually derive all of these formulas, right? So here you can realize the derivative of cinch would be cosh. The derivative of cosh would be cinch. If you take the derivative of tanch, you get the hyperbolic secant squared, very similar to trig functions. If you take the derivative of the hyperbolic secant, you get minus tanch, uh, hyperbolic tanch, hyperbolic secant. If you take the derivative of hyperbolic cotangent, you get minus uh, hyperbolic cosecant. Uh, if you take the cosecant squared, uh, if you take the derivative of hyperbolic cosecant, you get minus et cetera, right? Um, you will notice that these guys differ in signs, like in for regular trig functions. Um, there's a difference here. I want you to notice uh, the negative sign here. When it comes to regular trig functions, that's, that's actually not there, right? So if you were to take the derivative of secant of x, the derivative of C is secant x tangent x. You don't have that negative sign. But it turns out you'll have negative signs in weird places for the hyperbolic trig functions. But this is why they're actually convenient. Sometimes you want a different sign. Um, and so you can pay attention to those. But you can derive all of these formulas by just thinking of them in terms of exponentials and actually deriving the exponentials. Um, when it comes to the graphs, these are what they look like. So this is the blue line here is the cosh. Uh, these red lines. Uh, so this line here, this red line here is actually going to be e to the minus x. Uh, this red line here is e to the x. So if you add up these, the values from both red lines, if you take the e, the e, to, the mi to, e to the x plus the e to the minus x and you divide that by 2, you get uh, the blue line. Um, similarly here, this is the graph of e to the minus x, while let me move the chat box out of the way here. This other red line is the graph of e to the, uh, this graph here is e to the x. And this graph here is e to the minus x. And if you actually take this one and subtract that one and divide by two, you get the blue line. So you have your hyperbolic, uh, the graphs for hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine look like that. Okay. Um, so that's what the graphs would look like. Now, uh, another thing that's very convenient to know about is the inverse of the hyperbolic trig functions. One thing you can appreciate is, yes, I could write them in terms of exponentials and actually solve for the x using logarithms. And you can express all of the inverses in terms of logarithms. However, it turns out when it comes to calculus, you don't actually need to go through this process to figure out the derivatives. So for example, if I want to find derivatives of the integrals of these guys, um, Let's say I wanted to find the derivative of the inverse tanch, okay? So tanch is a function that I can find the inverse of. 
Okay, now how do I find the derivative of the inverse function? Now, yes, there was a rule that you had in Calc 1 where you know that the derivative of f inverse is just one over f prime evaluated at f inverse of the function. You don't need to do that either. Uh, we can actually derive this from first principles. So let's say I wanted to figure out what is the derivative of uh, the inverse of the tangent. What I could do is I could set uh, y equals the inverse tangent and notice that we want y prime. So what I can do is I can first just take the tangent of both sides. That would give me x. And now I can just actually differentiate both sides. So I can now just differentiate both sides with respect to x. All right, so what is the derivative of this, derivative of tanch? Oh, let me scroll back up. So here were the derivative rules. Um, pretty much uh, everyone should probably just take a picture of this with your phone so you can use it throughout the class. Um, we're going to be doing a lot of examples later, so you should know the rules of the game. So I'll pause here for five seconds so you can take a picture of that. Because uh, I'm going to be asking you to use these rules later on. Five, four, three, two, one. So take a screenshot or take a picture with your phone. Okay, so those are the rules. So now what's the derivative of tanch y? So I want to take the derivative with respect to x of tanch y. What is that? Hyperbolic secant squared. And? equals one. Uh, something is missing. Does anyone see what's missing? Is there I'm a... taking d dx of tanch of y. Is it dy? Uh, the derivative of y. Right. We need implicit differentiation here. Okay, so yeah, jogging your memory from calc one, this comes from implicit differentiation. That's why you have to multiply by the y prime because your y here, this is some function of x that you don't know what it is. So you have to multiply by the derivative of the inner function, right? So that using implicit differentiation is how you differentiate the left side. Okay, the derivative of the right side is one. And so now we want y prime. So I can just solve for y prime by dividing both sides by the hyperbolic secant squared. Now, um, another way to write the hyperbolic secant squared we had a formula earlier, this guy here, notice that the hyperbolic secant squared, I can write as one minus tanch squared. So this, I'm going, I can write it as one over one minus tanch squared. And what is tanch squared y? So earlier, you'll notice that from this guy, I had written down, uh, we set tanch y equals x. So what is tanch squared y? x squared. Right, tanch squared y is just gonna be x squared. So I can go here and plug that in. So I get uh, one minus x squared. So in other words, what I just proved was the derivative of the tanch inverse of x is one over one minus x squared. Okay. Similarly, I can derive the following, right? Which uh, at this point, I'll also ask you guys to take a picture, right? I could also derive the following that the derivative of the arc cinch is one over the radical of x squared plus one using a very similar maneuver to what I just did. Uh, the derivative of the arc cosh, one over the square root of x squared minus one. Uh, the derivative of arc tanch, I just proved that for you guys. It's one over one minus x squared. The derivative of the arc secant, et cetera, right? You have all these forms that you can derive in pretty much the same way that I just derived this. Um, 
just write them the other way, differentiate both sides using implicit differentiation, solve for the y prime, use an earlier trig identity to write that in terms of the original variable, and you can figure out all these formulas here. Now, going back to what I just proved, the derivative of the tang inverse equals one over one minus x squared. Remember, we also learned back in Calc 1 something called the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus, which pretty much told us that the derivative and the integral were almost inverse operations, right? Of course, if you integrate something, there's going to be a plus c, but we understood that from the Fundamental Theorem of Calculus. So pretty much the upshot is every time you learn a derivative rule, you're actually learning an integration rule in reverse. And therefore, we have formulas like this immediately coming into effect. Since I know that the derivative of the hyperbolic tangent is one over one minus x squared, I will automatically know that the integral of something that looks like one over one minus x squared is going to be the hyperbolic tangent inverse, right? Because I know the derivative rule in one direction, I automatically know the integral rule in the other direction. This is, was one of the very fundamental things that we learned at the end of Calc 1. Okay, so want to remind you of that concept. Right. So we're, 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 we're reminding ourselves of a, of a lot of Calc 1 concepts as we're going along. So um, every concept you learn in Calc 1, well, almost. Everything that you learned in Calc 1 about derivatives and integrals are super important. You can't forget those. We will be using them and you will need these concepts as we move on. Okay, so pretty much all the derivative rules I gave you before, the, you can think of them as integral rules in reverse, except you just add a plus C. Uh, because, of course, if you differentiate the constant, it goes to zero, right? And so here's one thing that you can notice here. If at any point during this course you have to do the integral of something like this, what is the integral of 1 over 1 minus x squared? You can automatically know, oh, it's the inverse hyperbolic tangent plus c, right? So it's convenient in the sense that you will know that. However, I will be showing you another way to find the integral of one minus x squared, which is a little, a little bit more constructive. It won't require you to memorize some formula. However, if you have this formula memorized, you can use it like all the time, right? So uh, that's gonna be nice, okay? So we are gonna see another way to integrate this, um, but for now you can actually know a shortcut to integrating something like this is the inverse uh, tang, okay? So for completeness, here are some other rules. Um, so I'll pause here for you guys to take a picture of that. But these rules are pretty much derived by just reversing these rules here, right? So we can automatically have all of these rules taking effect. And that's pretty much all I wanted to mention about hyperbolic trig functions. So yes, there's a lot more to talk about with the theory of hyperbolic trig functions. But for us, I really only care about you knowing them uh, in terms of formulas that you can use with derivatives and integrals. Sometimes you can have a very complicated integral and you can write it in terms of a hyperbolic trig function. Or you can have an integral of something like this and you know that it's the inverse hyperbolic of that. Um, Otherwise, sometimes hyperbolic trig functions come in handy where trig functions would be nice, but you're off by a sign, right? And I'll, I'll mention some of these moving forward. Uh, so uh, just a quick recap, hyperbolic trig functions. These are functions that were invented to find, to match map coordinates along the unit hyperbola. Uh, the X coordinate is mapped by the hyperbolic cosine. The Y coordinate is mapped by the hyperbolic sine. Um, we can create a lot of identities that follow directly from um, uh, very similarly from how we invented uh, trig identities. So we can invent the tanch and the hyperbolic secant and the hyperbolic cosh and something that I, I didn't list here, the hyperbolic cotanch. Right, so let's put that in. So we have all of these formulas, right? That we can get right away. So we have that guy, which we pronounce tench. I don't know of a, a nice shortcut to pronounce the other ones. I think people just usually call them hyperbolic. They put it in the name. So the hyperbolic tangent, we have, it's affectionately called tench. Hyperbolic cosine is called cosh. Hyperbolic sine is called cinch, right? So if you're talking about them, 
that's how you sh would usually say them. For the other ones, you'd say the phrase hyperbolic secant, hyperbolic cotangent, hyperbolic cosecant. Um, so yeah, they have a lot of nice identities that go along with them that look very similar to trig identities, but the signs are often different from the trig, ide the trig identities. Um, we can write them in terms of exponentials. This can uh, allow us to derive all sorts of rules about them. Therefore, we can derive all these calculus rules from them. And knowing about their inverse functions, uh, the derivative rules for their inverse functions are often very convenient for integration as well. So we can have a lot of these integration rules. Okay, that being said, let's actually go through some examples. So what I want us to do is we're going to go through all these examples here. And like I said, um, uh, don't really want to spend too much time. So normally I'll give you guys some time to actually try these on your own, but let's actually go through them together. Uh, so let me um, move these guys out the way. And let's actually do these. So hopefully you can, I don't expect you to memorize the rules very quickly. So you can pull up the picture that you took with your phone or the screenshot or whatever, and we're going to go through these. So the purpose of this, the exercise we're gonna do now is to one, for you guys to get used to using the rules that I just introduced. And two, it's actually going to jog your memory about a lot of things from calculus one that you might have forgotten regarding integration and differentiation. So, um, Here's where you guys kind of chime in and help me do these problems. So let's say I wanted to find the derivative d dx of cosh of x squared. How can I do that? First, you have to take the derivative of x squared, mm -hmm. and then you do the derivative of um, cosh, which is sine h of x. Yeah. So that would look like what? Chain Sorry. rule. Oh, sorry, you can go. Right. It's called a chain rule. And so the derivative of x squared is? 2x. 2x. The derivative of the cosh? Cinch. Cinch. Cinch of x squared. And this is the chain rule. Right. So this basically is me reminding you of the chain rule, right? Whenever you have an inside function, so the chain rule, let me quickly remind you of that. That is the rule that basically tells you the following, right? If you want to find the derivative of one function plugged inside another function, then you differentiate the outer function, leave the inside function alone, multiply by the derivative of the inner function. This is called a chain rule. And so this can help us generalize a lot of rules. So for example, if I know that the derivative of cosh is cinch, I will automatically know the following. I would automatically know that the derivative of cosh of something that is not x, call it u, is going to be u prime times sinh u. And that's me applying what we call the chain rule. So it's something that you would have done in Calc 1, but I just want you to remember that that's a thing that exists. So here your x squared you can think of as an inside function, and we can just do the derivative rules around that. So you differentiate the outer function, the derivative of cosh is sinh, multiply by the derivative of the inner function, which is going to be 2x. This is using the power rule from Calc 1. Okay, all right, cool. What about this one? All right, what about this one? one. It's a product rule. Right, you the product rule. How do you know you need the product rule? Uh, because we actually have two different functions. Okay, so this here and this here. So this is like an F and a G. And what does the product rule say? The derivative prime G. of FG is F prime G plus fg prime. fg prime. So when you have two functions multiplying each other, you do what you call the product rule. Uh, and so there's a very straight derivative rule that deals with that scenario. And so you just differentiate one function at a time and add them together. So in this situation, uh, what's that going to be? x squared minus 2 um, cosh x.
Yeah. Plus 2x cinch x. Right. And so, well, I mean, how we wrote this, it's, this is here is f times g prime, and this is plus f prime times g, right? So that is the, uh, the product rule, okay? Okay, this one. It's another chain rule. Okay, what rule are you thinking of? Uh, tanch of x is a function within the function of the natural log. Right, so if I have ln of something, what is the derivative? It's one over u. Uh-huh. Uh, t times the derivative of the bubble. Right, so it's u prime over u, right? So that's the rule. And in this case, the tanch is like the u, right? Okay, so this is a rule that you'd have learned in Calc 1. And so uh, in this scenario, that's the rule that we're going to apply. Okay, so what would that look like here? Hyperbolic secant squared over over tanch x. All right, and that's your answer. And let me go through and box all the answers. So that's the answer here. And that's the answer here. Okay, so we've reminded ourselves of the chain rule, the product rule, the rule, how we differentiate LNs. Um, now, uh, let's remind ourselves how to differentiate exponentials with a constant base. This was actually something I asked you on uh, the test, on the quiz last Friday. So what's the rule here? What does the left side of the rule look like? What would apply? The curve. The coefficients just disappears. I'm not sure what that means. So, so the, the rule starts out this way, a to the x, right? How do you differentiate a to the x, where a greater than 0 is a constant? Oh, it's a, it's a, I didn't realize it was a power. Yeah, this is, this, this is a 5 raised to the cinch. Okay, so how do you differentiate a to the x? a to the x ln a. Right, so the rule is uh, a, a to the x times ln of a, which by the way, there's a chain rule version. So if I want d dx of a to the u, that's going to look like u prime a to the u ln a, right? Again, some of you learned from Calc 1, but I want to make sure you remember these rules. So. Um, by applying those rules, what can I do here? The derivative of 5 raised to the cinch x is going to look like what? Cosh x times 5 to the cinch x times ln 5. Exactly. Now, hopefully, one of the things that I'm hoping that you guys are learning by osmosis here is that the rules are your guidelines, they're your templates. Pretty much a problem is only going to be difficult if you don't know what rule is being applied. So a lot of people will get things wrong and they'll say like, I, I don't know what's going on. Uh, I've been studying so hard. The problem is you're not knowing all the rules. So knowing the rules is the very first basic, one of the, the fundamental basic things that you need to know. So you have to know about all your calculus rules, you have to remember them because at the end of the day, when you look at something, the trick is going to be you figuring out what rule do I know applies to this scenario? What does this look like? Is there a rule that I could literally drop on top of this thing that looks like a template for dealing with this situation? Um, 
there's going to come a point in this class where we're going to learn a lot of uh, different techniques to attack uh, various problems. And students often get lost, they get stuck, they, they find it very difficult. But the trick around problems like that is first, knowing the rules and knowing how to view them as templates for the situation that you're in. And it turns out that that is going to be your guide as to what you apply in strategy. And strategy is something I'm going to be talking about as we move on as well. But let's actually uh, keep going. Derivative of tanh x all over x. What do we do here? Quotient rule. Quotient rule, right? Uh, let's just make sure that we're all on the same page. So quotient rule. So this is basically saying that you can have one function divided by another function. Of course, your denominator cannot be zero. And what does that say? F prime G minus G prime F all over G squared. Right, so that's the quotient. Okay, so what does that look like here? Hyperbolic secant times x minus tanh x over x squared. Isn't it hyperbolic secant squared? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Great. So uh, we have that. Okay. And, and so are we all following? Is there anyone who doesn't know what's going on? Like you, you can stop me to ask questions as well, but are, are we doing okay? Just want to make sure everyone's... Well, everyone I actually had a question, yeah. not with yes. one of the problems we've done, but I was looking at the rules for the derivatives of the inverse hyperbolic functions. Yeah. And I noticed that the derivative of the inverse hyperbolic cotangent is the same as the derivative of the inverse tanh. So does that mean we could just use any of those for the integral of one over one minus x squared? Yes. Um, it, it would be more customary to use the tanh though. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, what about this? Let's uh, do some integration. Integral of tanh. What do you guys think? One over one minus x squared plus c. One over, why would you say that? What rule is that? Oh wait, never mind. It's the, it goes the opposite way. Right, it goes the opposite way, yeah. And, and, and that also deals with the inverse, right? So it doesn't deal with tanh. How do you uh, integrate tanh? Can we rewrite it, as that, rewrite it as the integral of cinch over cosh x dx and then make cosh our u? Right, so this is... Uh, a reminder for substitution. So you can set u equals cosh. Your du is going to be cinch x dx. Um, I mean, cinch x dx is right there. But I know a lot of students who actually like um, doing a step where they solve for the dx and then actually substitute it. So I'll go through that. I mean, you can literally just swap out cinch x dx for u, don't get me wrong. And normally I do that, but a lot of students actually like solving for the dx. So I'll do that. And so uh, our integral, let's call this i, uh, would become cinch x over cosh, which is u, and our dx is du over cinch. And of course, those guys end up uh, canceling with each other. So 
So we end up with the integral of one over u du. How do I integrate one over u? It's the natural log. Natural log of what? U. The absolute, absolute value of u. No, absolute value of u, right, plus c. And so now uh, you go and you plug that in. So we originally had uh, u equals cosh. And so that's going to be your answer. So the absolute value is actually important. You have to remember that. Now, in this case, strictly speaking, the cosh is always positive. Um, so um, absolute value not necessary here since uh, cosh is actually always positive but leave it in. You're potentially wrong if you leave it off, so just always leave it in uh, just to make sure you're not in a situation where you could be wrong. Um, but as long as what's inside this thing is always positive, the absolute value is just going to return whatever the inside is anyway. Um, but let's just be safe and follow the rules. Leave it in. Uh, buh, buh, buh. Let's look at all right. This, what do you guys think? The integral of e to the two x divided by one minus e to the four x dx. Ideas? And again, you have all your rules. It's okay to look at the Replace, rules. Replace um, e to the with u. E to what? Replace the whole e to the 2x with u because then it'll follow the system that will get us back to our Okay, can. so if u is equal to e to the 2x, our du would be what? 2e to the x. e to the 2x. Okay, so this means uh, 1 half du is equal to your e to the 2x dx. Um, which we have uh, right here. So we have the e to the 2x dx and we have the e to the 2x dx. So I can replace that with one half du. Okay, so what's going to happen to the integral? What's our new integral going to look like? It'll be um, so. I have one, one half, half du that du replaces that. Yeah. Over one minus um, square of du, or du or u squared. Sorry. U squared. All right. Now, how do you integrate one over one minus u squared? Isn't that arc tangent? Right. So that's the tangent inverse. And so this becomes the tang inverse of e to the 2x plus c. All right. Okay, so that's pretty good. We made quick work of that. Uh, reminded ourselves of some very important uh, concepts from Calc 1 along the way. Of course, not exhaustively. There are a lot more Cal 1 concepts that you should know, but I just thought I'd take this opportunity. You know, it's the start of the semester. Uh, a lot of people have probably forgotten a lot of things by now. Um, so I just wanted to make sure of you knowing the thought process.
But yeah, those are all the examples for hyperbolic trig functions. So in terms of what you need to know about these guys, essentially you should know things like that. Um, know how to do, use them to do calculations in calculus. Find derivatives, find integrals. Um, yeah, things of that nature. I have a quick question yes. for that last one. Um, yes. So since we made u e to the 2x, how come when we like substituted it in, we didn't put it like u over 1 minus? Like how did it end up being the u squared again? Oh, because uh, this guy was already taken out by the du. Right, the oh, e okay. to the 2x dx, that gets replaced by the du. So technically you don't have him there in order to replace him with the u anymore. Because the one half oh, okay. du already replaced the guy in the numerator. I see, I see, thank you. Right? So the, the one half du replaces up here. So this, what's circled in blue is replaced by one half du. So you no longer have that guy there. The only guy you now need to replace is the e to the 4x. Right, so what you have left over now is the e to the 4x. Right, and so now you realize, oh, e to the 4x, I can just think of that as e to the 2x squared. And so that just becomes u squared. Thank you. Yeah. And so that's why the guy in the denominator gets replaced by u, but the guy in the numerator did not, because the guy in the numerator was already replaced pr previously. Um, so yeah, we just ended up with this. Okay, so that was our crash course in hyperbolic trig functions. Um, they can be very convenient uh, for the calculations that we're going to be doing. But now, uh, Da, 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 da. We're going to go on to the main thing. Of course, we're not going to finish the topic, but we're, we'll get it started and continue um, with this next uh, class. But this is going to be essentially phase one of our class. So if you look at our class, uh, take the bird's eye view, overall, it's going to be kind of dissected into four phases. So phase one is going to be the fundamental techniques of integration. So in a lot of Calc 1, what you guys were doing last semester or whenever you did Calc 1, a lot of that was about techniques of differentiation, right? So that's about you learning the chain rule, the product rule, the quotient rule, uh, and all these other rules of derivatives and how you can take derivatives and how you can apply derivatives, et cetera, right? At the end of Calc 1, you started learning about the fundamental theorem of calculus and you started learning about a process called integration, where the point of integration was to find the area under a curve and we needed to do that to solve various other problems. However, we use the fundamental theorem of calculus to know that, hey, we can also think of this as the reverse of differentiation. However, you didn't learn a lot of techniques in calculus one for integration. You learned about uh, pretty much three things actually. So you pretty much learned that every derivative rule is really an integration rule in reverse. So pretty much I can have a set of basic rules for integration. So I can have the integral of something that fits very nicely with a function that I know how to differentiate. And so I'll automatically know how to integrate that. This is called integration by, via basic rules. Another thing that you would have learned in Calc 1 is sometimes at face value, you cannot do this, but you can simplify things so that you are able to, to apply these basic rules. And then the next thing you learned about was integration by substitution, which we did some examples of this uh, a few minutes ago right? Where you have something that looks complicated. It doesn't look like any basic rule, you know. However, if you use a single variable to replace an expression, you can transform the integral into something that looks like a basic rule you already know. However, so those are three strategies that you learned in calculus one for doing integrals. It turns out there are actually many more strategies for doing integration. And that's going to be one of the phases of this class. So phase one is going to be about fundamental techniques of integration. I'm going to teach you a bunch of different other techniques and strategies for attacking integrals computationally, right? So very important thing. And these guys are fundamental. So once you learn these now, they will forever be useful for the rest of your life, right? No matter how far you go in, in, in mathematics, 
yes, you're going to have in various things like, you know, complex analysis and in higher level physics classes, some shortcuts that you can take. But the techniques that I'll be teaching in this class are fundamental. They will always be relevant forever after this, right? It's not going to change. So phase one of the class, fundamental techniques of integration. I'm going to teach you different techniques, strategies, uh, and strategies for doing integrals, okay? Um, the second phase of the class is going to be on sequences and series. The third phase of the phase of the class is going to be on parametric equations and polar coordinates. And the fourth phase is going to be on some uh, basic uh, three-dimensional geometry, three-dimensional uh, stuff that we can do in 3D. So those are the four phases of the class. Uh, phases one and two are the largest phases. So for phase one, fundamental techniques, we're going to pretty much be spending almost a month on this stuff. So there's a lot of fundamental techniques. Ultimately, we're going to learn about nine of them or eight. Uh, so yeah, so that's what we're actually going to be doing and that's what we're gonna get started with today. So fundamental techniques of our integration. This is what we're going to be spending a while on starting now. Uh, as I mentioned, there are some basic formulas that you should have seen since Cal 1. Uh, integral of a constant is just a constant times x plus c. Integral of x to the n is x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 plus c when your n is not minus 1. If your n is minus 1, the integral of 1 over x dx is ln of absolute value of x plus c, et cetera. Integral of e to the x is e to the x plus c, et cetera, right? So these are a lot of rules that you have learned. Here, since the beginning of this lecture, uh, you learned about some other rules here. So that's these guys are here and these guys are all basic rules. So there are some new things that we just learned. So I can mark those here. So these you would not have learned in Calc 1, but pretty much what I just showed you uh, So these are all uh, new. So the asterisk means new. All right, so these are just some new rules that we just learned about. Okay. Um, also, when it comes to these formulas, there are some that I'm just not going to expect you to remember. Um, so usually, um, secants and tangents behave very similarly to cosecants and cotangents. So normally, I'm going to teach you strategies that go along with secants and tangents. And pretty much, uh, you can ignore things that deal with cosecants and cotangents. So uh, this means you are allowed to ignore, say, formula 11. You don't have to know that. Uh, formula 8, you don't have to know that. Um, formula 15, you don't have to know that. Formula 13, you don't have to know that. What else don't you have to know? Um, yeah, I'm pretty much never going to ask you about formula 20. And, yeah. Okay, but other than that, these are your basic rules. So when it comes to integration, as far as it goes, the rules that I expect you to know off the top of your head, I actually don't expect you to know 21 and 22. I mean, you can if you want, but um, pretty much any situation where you would end up with uh, rules 21 and 22. Later on in, the, in chapter eight, I'm gonna teach you another way to deal with those. Um, but yeah, so when it comes to the basic rules of integration, right? So you have some functions. What are the fundamental rules that deal with the basic functions? These are the guys that I expect everyone in here to remember and memorize and just know off the top of your head. I can ask you this in a quiz, for example. What is the integral of uh, cos secant squared? And you should be able to tell me, oh, that's tangent x plus c, right? Uh, so these are the rules that I expect you to know off the top of your head, right? So these are the ba what we call the basic rules, the basic integration formulas. A lot of these guys we learned just by knowing about derivative rules, and we just pretty much turned the derivative rules backwards, okay? Um, and so we get all these rules here. So from now on, these are the basic rules. Um, in fact, you probably want to take a picture of this. Uh, I will pause a little bit for you to get these pictures, take these pictures. Right, so these are rules that from now on, I expect you to know off the top of your head, okay? And how we want to deal with basic rules moving forward 
is it's best that you copy them with your own hand all in one place, right? So you can have an extra notebook or an extra few pages where you write these rules down on, okay? So you're gonna write down all these rules and pretty much every time you're doing a homework that involves integration, you should have these rules beside you, right? So you just have these rules written down on a piece of paper beside you. And pretty much you want to practice being able to see which rule applies to which problem that you are looking at, right? And you want to see how they apply in sort of a template fashion. Can I take this rule and fit it right on top of this thing that I'm looking at, okay? Um, and yeah, if you can, you can apply a basic rule, right? Now, uh, on top of these basic rules that I just mentioned, we know about that we can tweak things algebraically, as well as we know about substitution. Now, one thing that I want to mention uh, that's going to save uh, a lot of us a lot of time, substitution taught, taught us a nice little trick in Calc 1. Namely, if the thing you're substituting is linear, like AX plus B, it turns out that you can actually just find the antiderivative of the inner function and then just divide by A, right? Assuming A is non-zero. So what do I mean by that? So uh, example, let's not do that in red. So example, uh, we know that if I were to take the integral of say sine of X, what is the integral of sine X? Negative cosine x. Right, negative cosine of x plus c. Right, so what if I were to ask you, what about sine of 5x dx? Well, technically speaking, to do this problem, you go through a substitution. u equals 5x, your du would be 5dx, and then you put 1 over 5 du equals the, right? So you go through a whole process of substitution, but really, this is the kind of problem that I would expect you guys to be able to do like off the top of your head. You just realize that 5x is linear. You're just going to divide by the coefficient of x. Take the cosine of the inner function, and that's going to be your answer. Or, or similarly, another example, what is the integral of the sine of say 7x minus 12 dx? I expect you to pretty much immediately know that that's going to be minus 1 7th cosine of 7x minus 12. Yes, you can go through a substitution and end up the same place, but this is largely going to be a waste of time. Um, you are going to have to do problems that are a lot more complicated than this. You don't want to waste your time doing a lot of uh, things of this nature. So for example, we also know that e to the x dx is just e to the x plus c. This means if I were to ask you, what is the integral of e to the five minus three x dx? Can anyone tell me what the answer would be right away? Negative three e to the five minus three x. No, you're thinking derivative. Negative one third. Negative e one third. Five minus three x. Right. So yeah, technically you would do a substitution for that, but as you can see, you should be able to do that kind of off the top of your head. Whenever your substitution is substituting a linear function, uh, like here, five minus three x is a linear function. It looks like ax plus b. You don't have to go through a substitution. Just know that you're going to put 1 over a times whatever you know the integral formula tells you to, and you just leave the same in, inner function. Okay? So you learned that substitution was the reverse of the chain rule, and so that's why you leave the inside function, because the chain rule involves you leaving the inside function. So that's a nice little trick that we learned from substitution in Calc 1. I want you guys to remember it, because it'll save you a lot of time. Okay. Now, here is how I'm going to want you to think about things. We're going to learn many different techniques uh, and different methods for how to do integrals. However, I want you to learn these techniques in the concept within the envelope of a strategy. Because eventually what's going to happen is I'm going to give you guys random integrals to compute and you need to know what approach should I take? Is this 
substitution or integration by parts, or is this a partial fractions, or is this a lot of techniques I'm going to teach you about. And you're going to need to know, faced with this random problem, what is the approach you should take? And so I don't want you to learn all these techniques. Yes, in some sense, I want you to learn these techniques in isolation, but I also want you to know that they will fit into a broader strategy. So what we're going to be doing, and after I teach you all the techniques, I'm going to come back and I'm going to talk about the broader strategy, how all the techniques fit together. When would you choose what technique? What are things you would look for to know that you should try this versus that, right? Because at the end of the day, we're going to have a lot of options and it can be confusing what option to choose if you don't think of the overall picture. So when it comes to integration, there is an art to integration, right? So I call it the art of integration. Okay, so faced with some random integral of f of x dx, how do you actually go about computing it? So here's how you want to think about it. And I will be adding steps to this process as we go along. So step one, the first thing you want to do is try to apply a basic rule, right? The base, what is a basic rule? Well, it's the rules above that I had you take pictures of and that you're going to copy down. So you're going to try and take a basic rule. Every now and then you'll have an integral that just a basic rule applies. So for example, uh, if you see, oh, the integral of x cubed dx, right? You might see this integral. Hey, that's a basic rule. How do you know? Well, if I look here um, in item two, it, set, it tells me how to integrate x to the n, where n is a constant that's not equal to minus one. Clearly, I am in that situation right now. It's x to the n, but my n is three. So the integral of that is just going to be x to the four over four plus c, right? You add one to the power divided by the new power. It's just you applying a basic rule. So whenever you uh, are faced with a random integral, the first thing that you should think about, always the first thing that you should think about is, does a basic rule apply to what I am looking at? Okay, this is always step one, right? In fact, it's so basic, it should probably be step zero, right? So one, you need to know the basic rules, have them all written down in one spot. Whenever you're doing your homework or you're practicing for a test or a quiz, you have these rules beside you. Eventually, after using them so often, you'll kind of internalize them and memorize them automatically without even trying. And if you find that um, you have not memorized all of these guys automatically, which you, which, to the point where you don't have to look them up anymore. What that means is you're not practicing enough, right? So if you, if you find yourself that, oh, I still have to look at these rules that I wrote down, that is an indication that you didn't practice enough, okay? There are going to be times when you're not sure how long should I be studying? How hard should I be working? This is one of the ways you know that you should be working harder. If you cannot think of a basic rule and you don't know it off the top of your head, it means you're not working hard enough. You need to try working harder. It needs to be more familiar. You need to do more problems, okay? You need to, once you write down the basic rules, you need to get to a point where the basic rules are internalized. That is important. That is going to be the difference between you surviving the class and you mastering the class. You being an A student and knowing that you can get an A and you don't have to be worrying. When everyone else is stressing out, you're not stressing out. It's just par for the course for you. A part of getting to that level is internalizing the basic rules. And so that is going to be an indication to you as to how hard you should be working, right? So that is step one. Now step two, uh, so you have a random integral. The first thing you're gonna try to look for is, does a basic rule apply? Uh, if yes, apply the basic rule. If no, what you're going to try to do, can I algebraically simplify so I can apply a basic rule? So there are times when you can have something that doesn't look like a basic rule. So for example, let's say I had x cubed uh, plus three x squared minus seven over uh, x cubed. Okay, so at face value, this one does not look like a basic rule, right? Um, if you look in your table or the thing that you memorize, you look in your mind's eye, there's nothing on the left side of any of these equations that looks like this monstrosity right here, okay? So you see this integral, your first thought should be, hey, does this look like a basic rule? The answer here is obviously no. Um, then the next thought should be, can I simplify this to look like a basic rule? 
It turns out the answer to that question here is yes. How would we simplify this to look like a basic rule? We divide each term by the um, x cubed. Right. Uh, so there's, an, there's a single term in the denominator. That is an indication that, you know what, I can probably divide each term in the numerator by that. Uh, so what would I get after doing that? 1 plus 3 over x minus 7 over x cubed. OK. Now, how can I rewrite these guys so that they look like a basic rule that I know? One is already looking like a basic rule. Uh, is three over X a basic rule? Yeah. Pretty much, right? Except the constant is, but remember you can factor constants off. What about the seven over X cubed? Is that in the form of a basic rule? How would you integrate seven over X cubed? Rewrite it as seven X to the negative third. Right. And why would you rewrite as seven X to the negative third? Well, because writing something as X to a power is very convenient. What does it mean to be convenient? It means there's a rule that I know that looks like that, particularly rule two, right? So I want it to look like X to a power. In fact, one is basic because of rule one. It's just a constant. Right? So at this point, uh, I can actually apply a basic rule to each of these. So the integral of 1 is just x. The integral of this is going to be 3 ln of the absolute value of x. And the integral of this is I'm going to add 1 to the power. And then I'm going to divide by the new power, plus c. And that's going to be my integral. Right? So. Does it look like a basic rule? If not, can I simplify it to look like a basic rule? Is always the second thing you think. Uh, the third step would be to try substitution. Uh, uh, did this earlier. Uh, look back for examples. Now substitution allows us to go from a situation where we don't look like a basic rule to a situation where we do look like a basic rule. Um, I guess I could do so something like this, uh, x sine of x squared, right? What I could do is u equals x squared. My du is going to be 2x uh, dx. And so this can bring me to the situation where I end up with 1 half sine of u du. And the sine of u du looks like a basic rule. Right? So substitution is also something where we can go from something that looks more complicated to something that is a basic rule. Okay. Now, now and forever, this is something I want you to write down in your notebooks. Write it in red, put an asterisk around it, put a box around it, under, double underline it, write in all caps. Whenever I'm faced with a random integral, these are, this is, these are always the first three things that are going to go through my mind. You always approach a random integral with these three steps first every single time. One, does it look like a basic rule? Step two, if it doesn't look like a basic rule, can I simplify it algebraically to look like a basic rule? The third thing, can a substitution work? This is always, every single time, going to be the first three things that go through your mind. It's very important that you have this settled, okay? Now, beyond step three is where we're going to learn other techniques. Now, the first one is going to be, uh, here, step four is what I'm going to call you integration by parts. However, step four is probably a misnomer. It's not always the fourth thing you're going to try. I'm going to talk about the order in the steps. But the first three steps in the art of integration is always going to be the same. Afterwards, it would depend on what you're looking at. And I'm going to actually um, show you how to do these later on. So I mean, 
we don't have enough time for any examples, but I'm going to sort of show you where this rule comes from and we'll use it uh, next time. So this is another technique and pretty much it comes from reversing the product rule. So we learned that substitution was the reverse of the chain rule. It turns out that you can reverse the product rule. So if I have uh, the derivative of a product, notice that this is f prime times g plus f times g prime. Uh, what we can do here is we can integrate both sides. Now, the fundamental theorem of calculus tells us uh, pretty much when you integrate the derivative, it disappears, right? And there's going to be a plus C, right? So this is by the fundamental theorem of calculus. And here I'm going to have F prime times G plus the integral of F times G prime. And what we do now is we normally solve for one of the integrals on the right side. So I can solve for one of these integrals, right? So I'm going to solve for F times G prime. This is going to give me F times G minus the integral of F prime G. Now, normally we have a change of notation here. If I set F of X, equals u and g of x equals b. This means my f prime, I can write it as du, and my g prime, I can write it as dv. We end up with the following formula. The integral of u dv is equal to u times v minus the integral of v du. This is a very important formula, and this is called the integration by parts formula. It is now a formula that sometimes, and we'll talk about this more later, integration by parts formula. It's another formula that we now have to memorize. It is going to sometimes be a form that we can use to integrate products where one function we can think of as a u and the other function we can think of as a dv. Um, but this is a very important formula, which we'll do next time. In fact, we're gonna go through some examples. I will actually leave these examples. Maybe you guys can try it for next class, actually. Um, and so, yeah, we will pick up there um, next time. Will we get a so, notification? Um, sorry, sorry. So have... that's it for today's class. Uh, I just introduced integration by parts. We'll actually do some problems on that next time. Um, but yes, going on with your question. Sorry, um, yes. I was just wondering if we have, um, like, if we're going to get a notification for when, like, the assignment happens, or should we just check the uh, website? I forgot what it's called. Oh, you should just keep checking Cengage. Um, usually how it's going to happen is homework will be happening in batches. So you would have a bunch of homeworks that are due October 22nd. So pretty much everything that for test one, all those homeworks will be due just before test one. I do recommend that you do the homework as you go along, but you have until like October 22nd, I believe, to do all the homework that you need for test one. Then there's going to be a second batch of homeworks that are due uh, towards the end of the semester. So there are two main due dates for the homework. I believe the homework for chapter seven is already up. It's due on October 22nd, but the first section in chapter seven is integration by parts. So the moment we finish integration by parts, you should do the homework for that. Um, but no, I don't think it's going to send out any notification because it's, it's, it's only two due dates technically. Other questions before we head out? Yeah, so the homework for all of chapter seven is already posted. And they're due in October at some point. So normally you're not gonna get notifications on the homework. And normally I'm not really going to give you notifications on the Zoom lecture for the class. It's always gonna be the same link that you use to attend uh, these sessions. So the next session I will see you uh, is on Thursday and uh, you'd use the same link. Is we it possible for you to put the link on the Blackboard or something like that? Cause uh, right the link now is I on only Blackboard. have- It's in the announcements. Oh, oh okay, um, thanks. Yes. There was another do we have to, Yeah, do we have to keep registering for it? Yes, you have to register for each instance because I, I use that kind of as an attendance thing. 
Okay. Yeah, but it's normal that every time you sign up for, every time you use the same link to attend a new lecture, it always asks you to re-register. So if we forget to register, our attendance won't count and we come to class? Well, you won't, you won't forget because you won't be able to get into the class without oh. registering. So it's, it's yeah. Other questions? Okay, uh, we'll stop there. So uh, if you have any questions, email me. I am meeting with someone in office hours afterwards. I haven't forget, I will send you a different Zoom link. And for now we can wrap up. Uh, I will post this lecture video as well as the notes on in the description of the video and I will let you guys know when that is up. However, you already actually have the playlist for that. So you can go to that same link and see the playlist. Um, go over the notes. Go over the basic rules, write them out um, in a separate page, and try some of the problems that I will leave in the notes for next time. And uh, I will see you guys on Thursday. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Take care, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Uh, stay safe. And yeah, I will see you guys in the next one. Ciao.